Yes, after that, uh, she followed, she wrote a, a brilliant series of relatively short, very strange, troubling books, largely about um, the difficulty of dealing with other people, of living with other people, largely families, um, largely set in a sort of um, comfortable bourgeois um, society, um, always with a little tinge of the supernatural just over the top. She, her father was Senegalese, her mother French. She has steadfastly refused to be considered any kind of a Francophone writer, an African writer, a French writer of color. For her, she has always been a French writer and um, is um, adamant that she doesn't want to be considered anything other than that. And so her first books don't really ever talk about um, questions of race or even class. Um, Little by little, that begin to appear in her works, particularly with uh, the appearance of Trois Femmes Puissantes, which is uh, translated by John Freeman as, um, uh, I'm sorry, not John Freeman, but uh, as, anyway, as um, um, three strong women, three powerful women, three mighty women, might be other ways of saying it, three novellas essentially put together into one uh, depicting um, three women who are by any stretch of the imagination, not on the surface strong um, or powerful or mighty, but um, who survive in one way or another or not, as in the horrible last story. Since then, she's written um, ever longer, ever more complicated novels like La Divine, um, like um, um, The Chef, which is about a female chef, like Vengeance is Mine, which is the most recent of her novels, which will be coming out from Knopf in, uh, in a few weeks. Um, always with the same sort of preoccupations of the difficulty of surviving among other people with varying degrees of the supernatural explicitly or implicitly, um, but also written in a prose that is unlike any other. Um, her, she, her sentences tend to be long and fork off into directions you don't quite expect them to take. Um, never exactly formal, not exactly informal either. It's a voice that is so unlike any other writer than I could think of today, in French at least. I don't know much about literature beyond French, I'm afraid. Um, she is, her work has, as I say, fascinated me since I first discovered it almost 30 years ago. I've trans, I've taught it, I've read it and reread it, and eventually I learned how to translate it, um, I think. And uh, it is um, such a joy to see that that book, my um, a Self Portrait in Green, which I frankly didn't think would ever be published, um, has now reached the August uh, 10th anniversary and is being discussed by people like my fellow panelists here. I'm very grateful for that, and I'm really eager to hear what you have to say about it. Thank you so much, Jordan. I'm, I'm really curious what it was like um, encountering uh, Nidia's work at that time, 30 years ago. Um, how did it seem different? How did it seem fresh? And I'd love to turn the question um, over to my other panelists, too. What was your first impression reading and reading Nidia's book for the first time? Um, this is, it was so, in, you know, I loved your introduction, Jordan. It was just so interesting to me because I first read her in college in a class on, called Francophone Literature. So now I'm slightly horrified um, <laughs> that I sort of read her against her wishes. Um, but I did, you know, listening to what you said, I, it's now so much of this book sort of makes a lot of sense to me because, uh, there's this, you know, at one point a, a character is described as being, oh, you know, oh, she's such a typical woman in green. And the, it's just like, but there's no typical woman in green. That's a silly statement. It's a ridiculous sort of statement. It's like, if I miss something, was there a through line? No, no, I was like, no, there's no through line. So it's it. So I sense that there was already sort of something kind of playfully, like sort of playfully dismissive happening around kind of identity. So I think so much of what you said really, um, really resonated. Um, yeah, that's, she can be very, yeah. in the early books, excuse me, she can be very um, sort of um, 
um, almost mean about it because in, uh, for instance, La Sorciere, a wonderful book that hasn't been translated, I'm, I'm, I'm free to do it. Um, uh, you find yourself asking yourself, well, is this person black, the person who is narrating it? Because there's no sign that she is, and yet they're vague sort of little. And so you find yourself asking this horrible question that she will not let you not ask yourself. And uh, so clearly, even if she never, she doesn't, you know, she doesn't talk about about questions of race explicitly at that point. She's always trying to needle you with it, right? To know that, to, to, to make you wonder how you're supposed to feel about it. Yes. Oh, I, I'm, thank you, first of all. I'm so, so lucky to be here with all of you to talk about this writer that I am obsessed, maybe it doesn't quite capture <laughs> my <laughs> fascination. Um, I am, I came to her um, very recently. Um, so maybe I'm the newest of this cohort to discover her through Amina Kane's book, A Horse at Night, um, which is like a meditation on writing and the self and place and landscape. Um, and it's so connected to this self-portrait in green. Um, and my experience of her and of, of the language, um, I felt so disoriented. I felt uh, strange. I felt um, in awe. Um, there's so much, Jordan, in an interview you'd mentioned um, the way that you're talking about the unknowability of these other person these other people um and the perverse unknowability of them and i think that that is the thing <laughs> that really <laughs> that i'm so interested in even in my own work the you know proximity to people um sharing public and and domestic spaces and and what does it mean to be in proximity to people to share these spaces um so i'm just really fascinated by that and i think um this book examines that so well mm. um and i have to just echo what was said like i first picked up and um, my heart hemmed in i think it was i think i saw it on a list on the internet and i was just blown away by um you know it's another uh yeah, book that involves sort of a person walking through town and having their identity shift along the way. Um, and I had never seen someone make identity seem like both such a concrete thing, like coming again, up against the brick wall of um, your neighbors not liking you for a reason that you may or may not know. And then so liquid at the same time, it's shifting from moment to moment in a way that's not un unpredictable, but always surprising. Um, uh, it, it models something that I've always sort of wanted to do myself I think and it also is a page turner like almost Stephen King like in that way you can't put it down and you'll read it in one really sort of terrified gulp so I see a lot of that same fluidity happening in um, self-portrait in green and a lot of that um, controlled chaos the feeling that like there's something wildly transformable in this world um, and try as you might uh, to pin it down or to try to define it, it will always shift into a new form again and again. Yeah, yeah I love that. And that's such a, excuse me, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting people. Um, that's a, that is, that's, that's such a gorgeous book because at the beginning it's like, well, what is, why does suddenly everybody hate Nadja? What, what happened here? And again, she, she really wants to make it seem like it's uh, just plain racism, but in the end, it isn't exactly that. It's the um, well. I don't want to spoil anything, but but it's much more complicated than that. Um, it has to do with her and her relationship to her family. But it's. I agree. It's the first time I read that. Um, that was the book that made me decide I really have to translate in Jai. I was teaching it in a in a contemporary literature class, and 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 I and the students we were just <laughs> we were sort of like what is going on here what the hell is going on and I decided that that what the hell is going on is precisely the point of the book and then gradually she sort of pairs everything away and then you see what's going on and it's really complicated at the same time really simple it's just about not agreeing to be who you are but then also the torture of a world that says that you can only be who you are 
Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. No, Jen, please. I was thinking, I mean, I love this conversation about sort of identity and sort of the surreal in her, in her work. Um, uh, I, um, I think, you know, one of the reasons I was asked to participate in this was because um, someone involved read my review of St. Omer. And um, I was really sort of, you know, sort of taken in that film by, you have this woman who's on trial for, you know, obviously for awful crime but you know she's accused of sort of being under the influence of witchcraft and there's sort of this association of sort of black women with the occult of witchcraft and sort of um you know kind of uh you know, you know kind of you know sorcery and but the sort of the takeaway from that film is well no but you know racism is witchcraft because it can take reality and completely obliterate it you can take this brilliant woman who's a genius and you can have a system that on paper, you know, she's failing all her courses. Why is she failing her courses? Because they think it's really bizarre that this black woman wants to study European philosophy and they don't get it. Um, and so, and it, it sort of is a reminder that witchcraft is very much about power. Um, and so it's, you know, she has this just absolutely brilliant way of using you know, witchcraft and the surreal to think about identity in ways that I just, you know, very few people are um, are pushing us to think in that direction. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And the um, the it's a funny way in which her reputation in France is also um, I don't know. It it made me think of this. Uh, what you were what you were saying there, because she's she has a sort of a curious reputation there. She's um, she's, she's um, beloved of the critics, etc. If you look at uh, what French writers, what French readers say on Goodreads or the French version of Goodreads, uh, Babelio, um, there's often this kind of um, resentment of her for writing the way that she does, and it's almost as if. Um, because because she's difficult, you know, and it's almost as if there's a feeling that a, a person like this does not have a right to write books that I find difficult to understand. And so even just in the um, the you know that's 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 not exactly a witchcraft, but it's a way in which racism, if that's what is going on, I don't know who knows, but but it can it can skew your vision, yeah, obviously so much that even reading words can be reading words that aren't meaning to offend you in any way can still seem like an offense because it doesn't seem like the kind of thing that someone like that should be able to do. I mean, I think that um, it is really interesting to hold up uh, My Heart Hemmed In and St. Omer um, as these two works that are about um, uh, women being hemmed in by these forces around them that are unseen and sort of unarticulated, but very much concretely present. Um, and compare that to the category of women in green, which um, doesn't seem so oppressive exactly. It almost feels like a liberatory category. Um, what was a woman in green to you over the course of this book? Um, I um, It's interesting thinking about these systems um, what I saw in sort of like a thread for these figures, these green figures, is um, that they're social structures. They're they're the they're the infrastructure of of this place. I mean, they're tied to this place. They're tied to the town hall and the schoolyard and the domesticity and the drab kitchen and you know, they're driving, you know, the narrator's driving the children back and forth. And um, the way that she plays with time in that, that time is lost because it's so connected to duty and obligation to this place and to the, to the river and to it, to its overflowing, um, you know, them carrying the plastic furniture. I imagine that the, the figures in green are the ones that are carrying the furniture and driving the cars uh, to safety, uh, to higher ground. And so for me, I started thinking about it in that way. And then it connects to the, how these systems are put in place and then power and, and these dynamics. That's what I was thinking about. 
You know, I, as soon as I finished this novel, I mean, and this, I mean, this is true of all great novels. I think I instantly wanted to read it again because I sensed that I had read it wrongly the first time, but in a way that I feel like was intentional. Like I read it looking for a common thread, trying to figure out what all these women in green had in common. And I got to the end of the book and I realized, you know, I don't think I saw any of these women for who they are because I kept looking for the common thread. I kept trying to sort of categorize them, trying to figure out what one person had, what one woman had in green had to do with another woman in green. And then you get to the book and you just sort of realize, well, that's the whole problem with society. (laughs) The way I just read this novel, Um, you know, and it's sort of, you know, um, you instant, you, I just instantly just thought I, I can't wait to read this again. And on some level, just read these as people um, forgetting about whatever color, you know, they're associated with. Like a joke on categorical thinking in general. Yeah. Yeah. And it plays into the, the genre, you know, and that's also about, you know, a question of genre too. I kept also reading for the autobiographical and the self-portrait. And, I, and then I got to the end and I was like, why, why didn't I just read everything for what it was? Why didn't I just read the words on the page? You know, why did I keep looking for a category and, um, yeah, it was, it was a, just a great experience reading this novel. This, uh, this The book actually was written, um, for, uh, it was commissioned uh, by the Mercure de France, uh, which um, uh, was publishing a series of memoirs. And they were memoirs by often sort of famous people. There was, I, I'd have to go back and look, but I mean, I, I'm not fashion designers, you know, kind of, kind of you know, A-list uh, people who talked about their lives. And then they, somebody thought, well, it'd be interesting to see what Mind Jai would do if we asked her to write a memoir. And this is what you gave. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not good. But at the same time, um, she says at one point about those uh, about those women in green um, that um, they're, they're clearly a sort of a source of, you know, annoyance to her. I mean, every all of them are in one way or another irritating, um, but at the same time fascinating. And she says that she wouldn't be, they're a source of stories. And she loves stories, she says, and um, stories sort of come out of them. And she thinks that not knowing them would lessen her. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's not a definition. <laughs> Uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but but it is, I guess, a kind of a of a common, you know, of a thread. Um, but it is funny that that is always one of the first questions that people ask. You know, what is this woman in green thing? And they use there there are articles written by um, by by professors like me uh, trying to determine what a woman in green is. And uh, it's uh, it's a delight to be a translator and not have to decide questions like that, but simply allow them to be what they are. You know. I mean, um, <laughs> I think it's so funny that we're all um, forced to ask the question by reading this book, even mm-hmm. if we eventually discard the question. And um, it, it feels like, for one thing, like it really fits in with this um, mode of identity construction in um, Marie's work that is inductive rather than deductive. Like we can't go from a category to a uh, logical next step to a conclusion we are just taking information in all the time and readjusting constantly um and coming up with all of these sort of provisional um stopping points um but for those who haven't um yet read the book and who are um planning to start their women in green journey with this uh reissued version um we begin with a narrator who's um sort of spotting one woman um, who she thinks might be her friend, but turns out to be a false version of her friend in green shorts. And she's um, irritated by this woman. This woman like leaps from a balcony and is just fine. Like, And then more and more of these strange women in green start popping up. And some of them are um, uh, her her stepmother, a former friend who ends up um, marrying her father and sort of really disarranging the whole um, family structure. And then her own um, biological mother, um, and then uh, another woman we hear about in a friend's story, and and then even um, herself, which I think is interesting because I remember feeling like this category was sort of defined as the other to my narrator, and now suddenly um, she's implicated in that category herself. So, you know, 
a joke on um, category thinking, but also like this strange, like overabundance, overflowing or flooding out of categories. <laughs> you will be a woman in green someday, even if you are not at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, and it's so, one of the things I loved about this was even though it was so like sort of playful and sort of surreal and sort of, you know, um, kind of just sort of took you on this ride, there also were just moments that I felt that were just so profound that just I just related to so strongly, even though I obviously don't live in this sort of magical world populated by green people. Like, um, you know, there's that part where she's talking to someone and, um, one of her friends who's, you know, childhood lover is uh, married now to a woman in green. And she's sort of regretting that, you know, she didn't, um, that she didn't marry him. And, you know, she's like, we're not young anymore. And she's like, you know, what do you, what do you mean? She's like, you know, we don't have as many choices. And the narrator's like, isn't that great that we don't have as many choices? And I thought that was such an interesting novel I mean sorry comment about life but also about kind of genre I couldn't stop thinking about genre and this book and and there's this question to sort of does genre and genre conventions you know does it hem us in or does it kind of relieve us of certain choices that we have to make um I, I I remember just thinking this must be a really, you know, I'm a, more of a critic and reporter than a, a novelist and a non-novelist at all. But I was thinking, gosh, this must be just for a novelist to read this must be just um, or for, you know, someone who does nonfiction, any kind of, you know, creative writing just must be so satisfying to read all of this about the choices that you make as a writer and whether or not those choices are freeing or or uh, the bane of your existence. <laughs> Yeah, the fiction writer, how did it make you feel as a fiction writer? <laughs> That's my question to the fiction writers here. Um, I, uh, I think, I think you're right. I agree. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I didn't find out about the sort of autobiographical, despite the title, I didn't know what I was reading the first time that I read it. And, um, and so I was like very free and open um, but then understanding now the the details um, that mirror uh, Ndai's own life and um, but also the way that I mean for me I don't I don't con as a fiction writer I don't really think about genre I'm like I don't think that the parameters are real basically I don't I think everything that's written is is imagined and surreal and fiction in my mind and constructed and so um so that's the way that I think about this book as well and and also any non really any nonfiction that I read um it's you know it's a particular perspective it's a particular angle it's so for me everything that I read has a sense of the imagined in it um so it is I mean it's one it's it's wonderful though as a fiction writer to read this book it, it's it opens up so much it, it made me question so many things like I was thinking about the way that they think about behavior and what, what goodness who is good in this book you know um, there's a questioning of the children are the children good it's a constant refrain and and so then are the adults any good is the mother any good is the narrator any good like these, all of these, there's so many things that I'm thinking about as I'm reading and questioning. Um, and then all of the doubling. I, I, one thing that I really was so interested in, it, in the narrator's perception of the green figures um, and all of, for all of you is be, because when I first read it, it didn't have any images and now it's, it's published with images. I wonder, for Jordan, what was your experience of the images? Because you have probably read it with the images um, years, 20 years ago, whenever. Um, and now for me, it's so interesting because the images, the way they appear and reappear and the figures are in the foreground and then they move or they're just out of frame. For me, it gave me the experience of the narrator. It, it made me feel like I don't know when these figures are going to be appearing for me or disappearing and I have no control. And so it, it amplified sort of the, the experience for me and understanding what the narrator's 
uh, despair might be or frustration or whatever. And I just wondered how you all thought of the images, if they if they changed anything for you, how you experienced them in relation to the text. Or maybe not. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, I, I already had a copy of this and I read the old copy with no images. And then in um, reading a little bit more about the book, I, I found that um, it's supposed to contain images and half of them are from um, Nigaya's own collection and then half are from someone else's, which seems pretty audacious when you're asked to write a memoir <laughs> to just intermingle <laughs> the work of two different people. Um, so I can't speak to it and I wish I could. That's another reason to buy another copy and read the book again. Yeah, I mean, they're not, I feel like I I looked at them the way I read the rest of this novel, which is like sort of to the extent that they were real, I just sort of took it with a grain of salt. I was like, I, I was like, I don't even know if this is, I, I don't know if these are pictures of anyone who <laughs> um, she's actually related to. Like, I can't take anything at face value. Um, so I sort of actually read them as sort of like, I sort of looked at them as kind of quirky little inserts. Um, I didn't think too much about them. That's what it was for me too. I didn't, um, um, yeah, I, of course I, I read it and thought it with with uh, the images. Um, I've also sort of, sort of ignored them, you know, they're, it's their, yeah, quirky. <laughs> is uh is a really good way to put it i mean they're they sort of echo vaguely kind of um uh, not there's they're not in any kind of particular dialogue with the text i don't think they're they're moments i suppose that are that feel separate from the text but that to me i guess what really um made them make sense in the text is the feeling of kind of of oldness and distance and um a kind of I don't know how to say this. It's not drabness, but it, you think of that story of Jenny in the middle, which is one of the saddest stories in all of French literature, uh, contemporary French literature, I think. Um, there's something very sort of sadly um, dreary about that. You know, it's not beautifully tragic, although there's a lot, but I mean, it is dreary more than anything else. And so what I really thought of the pictures as as was little manifestations of this dreary existence you know um and so i don't really pay that much attention to them and uh then when the um when this new edition came out um i, I said oh yeah pictures yeah and i was thinking it doesn't it kind of changed my mind a little bit um i think that in the original the pictures are printed quite small and you can't really see them very well seeing them a little bit bigger like this they have a bit more of a presence and i think that they do i think beautifully um underscore a, a general grayness of the tone um, I don't know if that's the right word, but uh, but um, uh, um, let's just go with grayness for the moment. And um, so, in that way that they work, they, they work. But uh, my my mind and my heart are so captured by the beauty of the prose that uh, you know, I kind of overlook them a little bit. To me, it also is a continuation of how this book plays with. Um... I hate to keep uh, using the G word genre, but I mean, I thought about this because I'm I'm in theory supposed to be writing a biography. And as part of the proposal, they apparently like to have photos when you're writing a biography. And so I'm just, I, I've never really been that into when I'm reading like biographies, those, you know, everyone looks the same. Everyone's in some sort of like black and white little Victorian looking down. I don't, I just feel it sucks the life out of these very lively people, you know, and, um, uh, and yet there's an expectation that you're going to have that sort of like those pictures in the middle. Um, and so to me, I think we're having been working on this. I thought it was also a little funny and I halfway wanted to just like see if I could do this too, just put in some like fake photos. <laughs> I can't, I can't. But it's it's see, I, I'm I'm I've 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 a uh, genre envy. I wish I could do that. Well, I love I love the idea of using found images, um, like Sebald C- and like how he uses images that you don't you know they are related to. The narrative, but you you can't you don't know where they come from, and and it adds some something of something of of mood and tone of and again the unknowability and 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 like it's not 
you can't like grasp things like things are just fleeting and and so I love the idea of incorporating I think you should think about just using some <laughs> found images and some <laughs> that would be interesting uh maybe <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, bringing up the topic of genre, which does seem so important to this book, how it like somersaults across a couple different ones um, through the course of it. I wonder if anyone has any thoughts on how um, this self-portrait might relate to the genre of autofiction um, we talk about a lot. Like, um, is the granular aspect, like that sort of reminded me of some um, autofictional works, but then the way it keeps disrupting the mundanity of life um, was was very much not so. Yeah, I mean, I guess there was sort of, I, you know, I'm embarrassed to admit, yeah, there were a couple places where I Googled to see if there was a similarity between something in the book. I was like, oh, you know, what did her father do for a living? I suddenly became kind of interested in these sort of things. And I'm slightly embarrassed to admit that. Um, but I do think it's probably, yeah, because I am a contemporary reader who's been sort of, um, you know, kind of initiating this, this kind of auto fiction world that you do, you are, I am expecting there to be a lot of overlap. But in this book, I kept finding a lot of the times when I would Google, it'd be like, no, there's no, there's no basis to, and I just sort of stopped. I just sort of stopped. There's a, there's a little bit, the, her husband uh, in the book, Jean-Yves, uh, she calls him, uh, was uh, indeed Ndiaye's uh, husband at the time, a good writer called Jean-Yves uh, Sandré. Um, and um, the visit to the father possibly reflects um, the fact that she didn't see her father. Her father left the family uh, when she was quite young and moved to Africa, and she didn't see him until she was in her early 20s. So it it echoes a little bit. Um, I guess myself, I'd say that one difference that I see is that uh, Unlike a lot of what is called autofiction, really the narrator of this thing is so, is just, she's reactive more than anything else. She's just kind of, she's seeing this stuff, right? She's not, is she a character? I mean, she's sort of an eye, um, not exactly a character, I don't think. She's she's a, a person who sees and who has thoughts about things, you know, tells us about them sometimes in uh, in no uncertain terms, but um, but there's little fiction to her in the sense of um, her being a, fictional character she's somebody who looks at stuff often kind of um askance or wryly and that's that's i think that's largely it it was i did catch myself reading and thinking at certain points i bet that's real i bet that really happened and then but i felt like that said more about me and what i find believable as opposed to to anything like there was just this really heartbreaking scene where um you know um someone overhears these grandparents really just feeling upset about all you know how burdened they've been by their grandchild and having to raise a grandchild and then then the person comes back later and they don't know they're being you know they're not being eavesdropped on now and so I'm like, oh it's everything's great I just had this sinking feeling that that really happened. And I don't know if it did, but then that made me ask myself, why do I think that's real and not other stuff? I, I mean, I think like um, what it really pushed against for me was the realism of conventions of representation that that we would expect a person to be more realistic when they're um, self-same and consistent when they continue the storyline they started the last time we saw them but so often that isn't the case and I think like in in the unpinned downableness of these characters it, it really felt like well this is getting at the feel of a life lived by someone who can't quite let go of the goal of representing um, and understanding the world around her which felt very human me. The one thing I'd really love to know what you all think um, is um, what about that one moment of something which clearly doesn't, I'm assuming, is not uh, in any way real and um, is uh, so overtly um, uncanny that um, you don't know what to do with it. And that's the appearance at the beginning and the end of this fast moving black feature who just yeah what is what is what do we do with that i love 
loved that that ending. This was one of my favorite endings of a book ever, ever. <laughs> so good. I don't. I, I feel like it's. I mean, that's what's so wonderful about this book is that everything that we're saying is right and not right because it can be. I mean, this book can be anything, truly, but for the way that I was thinking about it was related to the children because it begins with the children with the witnessing and the observation of the children and the surveillance of the children and then it ends with the surveillance of the children and that that worrying of of being a parent and and running to them as they're observing so it to me it's connected in some way to um you know the children you know, the way that these green, they're also green figures to me and that the mutability of, of them and their growth and, and how uh, in the beginning, um, they look at her, they're obedient, they're good, they listen, they, they trust her. Um, and then by the end, you know, they, um, they're quiet, they don't respond to her anymore, they're quiet. Um, so I thought it was something it's, they look and they give her a look, their lips are very red, she says, they give her a a, a knowing look at, as, as if they've realized something about her that they hadn't realized before and something has shifted. And so because it's connected to that, I, that's sort of what I, what I related it to, but I could be wrong. That's, that is, that's the wonderful thing. That is so great. I never thought about that before. And that just, that sounds absolutely right to me. And uh, thank <gasps> you. That is just terrific. <laughs> for, for me, like I, um, you know, what I, seized on with the women in green was like um that the frustrating thing about them is their capacity to change you know one goes from being your best friend to being your new stepmother and like um there's something that's always escaping understanding so it seems right that this book and that um uh the author herself who i think is a woman in green as much as anyone is um, would reintroduce something that seems to puncture the sense of um, self-containedness that you've struggled to build in the book. Like um, this this black creature that doesn't fit the iconography of um, of the other things you've seen is just going to run through there one more time and and wow. disarrange it. <laughs> oh, thank you to you too. My goodness, I'm learning so much. <laughs> that's 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 so. It's a, it's such a great, I mean, my goodness, that ending is so, and also just like that one little change that she makes in the, what she's going to tell her kids, like, right. And she's like that, just kind of that moment. Mm -hmm. And then they, you know, they look at her and it's just like, you realize it's like all it takes, all it takes in your life is one moment when you question reality mm -hmm. that it can change everything about your, the way you perceive everything. And it was just, I don't know, I'm just going to be thinking about that for a really long time. Let me think about that ending for a long time. Um, we're coming toward the uh, audience Q&A part. So I just want to remind you that you can put your questions um, down here in the Q&A section. Uh, and, and please ask us all questions. Um, maybe I'll just turn to the first one and we can continue our conversation too. Um, in the meantime, but um, this is from Sharon, and uh, this question reads: Were there any particular phrases or passages that were challenging to translate? And if so, how did the translator choose the direction in which to express the original language? <sighs> particular phrases or passages? Every single one of them. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's standard for it, or at least for me in translating. So the way that I that I translate is um, just to I bang out something. And then I revise for months and months and months, and I just go through and then I, you know, am always thinking, is this, does this say what the text says, but also does this sound like this character? Does this sound like this, um, this, uh, this writer? Does it work? You know, and um, it's, um, I have absolutely no theory, no technique, no anything about that, apart from looking again and again and again what I write, what the author writes. Sometimes I look at my stuff by itself, my translation by itself. Sometimes I compare it. Um, but I'm always trying to find some way in which I can say this this does something that that does. And um, the, the problem with translation is that every single sentence, um, you there are probably 15 ways to do it right. And um, and any of those ways could also be wrong, you know, uh, because it depends on the 
voice or the moment or context or the rhythm or a thousand other things um for me it's just it's just again and again and again and again um look 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 and um um compare what you hear in your head when you read the way you see on the page question for jordan in relation to translation um well first one um, fascinating thing that i heard was that you translate back backwards and forwards like from like going which I think is incredible. Like you go front to back and back to front and yeah. But um, I, my first language is Italian, have lost it, gained it, lost it, continue to try to recapture it <laughs> every day. Um, and I was so curious about um, rhythm and for example, um, in my experience of, of reading in Italian, a lot of authors, they, um, they go, you know, like run on sentences, commas, commas, punctuation. And I was just wondering for how you think about rhythm and um, the American reader and things like that in relation to the French reader. Yeah, really good question. Because um, <clears throat> Jaya really does all, you, she uses the resources of the French language uh, in terms of sentence structure and things like that um, very, very um, seriously. And um, not all of those are transferable into English. So it would be very nice if you could just have every sentence structured exactly the way that she does, but you just can't. At the same time, um, I don't want to turn in this into something that's simply readable because that's not that's not what it is either. And so it's um, going back to what I said before, just this endless series of compromises between how do I... What can I, where can I follow the text? Where can I do it exactly the way it does it? Where do I have to make, hopefully discreet, hopefully well thought out changes to make it do what it does, but the way that we would do it in English, not the way that we unfortunately can't do it because we don't, because we're not in French, but there's no, there are no certainties. There's no, you know, there's nothing but um, endless going back and trying again and again. That's so interesting. Was there any um, one thing that couldn't make the trip over? To English that you regret leaving behind? I I can't. This sounds so vain. I I can't think of anything. I think actually, um, it's a uh, no. I uh, looking back at it, you know, it's um, you're all writers. You know what it's like to look at something that you wrote a long time ago. It's it's horrifying, right? Um, and <laughs> I have to say, um, since I've begun being vain, I might as well go on. Um, wow, that actually um, that actually feels like. A thing you know so i cannot think of a single failing yeah i can say but but i i, I can't i know i can't i can't think of anything that's so great i mean i feel it's wonderful to read it's totally whole to read <laughs> i have to agree <laughs> um we have a question from greg um greg says i see that today is also the publication day for a new paperback of that time veer which was my first in Yaya. I wonder if you all could talk a little bit about that novel if there's time. It has stayed with me, the strange horror of it. And that is definitely the word, the phrase. Talk about endings. My favorite ending of, of, uh, in all of French literature is that book. It just, oh, um, it's already bad, turns into a nightmare that gets increasingly worse. And then the taxi breaks down and, well, it's... Um, and I have, uh, my students hate that ending. They say, well, but, and I've seen, even seen reviewers on Goodreads who say, could possibly the translator have left out the last three pages of the book? That, that kind of, um, that's kind of a good jumping off point for um, my sort of selfish question, which is um, I review a lot of literature and translation and I think there's more and more critics who are trying. There's been a big push for more reviews of literature and translation recently. And I'm just sort of wondering um, how you feel about, do you feel, what do you, what do you sort of want people who review literature and translation to kind of keep in mind that maybe you think we um, tend to, to kind of look past? Is there any hope you have for, for critic literary criticism of books and translation there is so much more uh criticism of you know reviews of books and translation now than there were when i started out you know um there's so much more it's gotten so much better there's so many more translations being published this is a wonderful time in that way 
Um, I can tell you one thing that really that just makes my blood boil whenever I see it in a review um, is are the words something to the effect of um, maybe it's the translation, but the writing of this book is strangely choose the word you like, stilted, oversimplified, whatever. Um, and that to me is a is um, um, the work of a really um, un um, you know, um, irresponsible reviewer. If you're gonna, if you want some, if you want to say something about the style, then you should find out to what degree it is the translation or is not the translation. That maybe it's the translation thing is is just this weird way of saying this was a little odd, uh, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna look into why. That's terrible. It would be nice if people trusted translators a little bit more. Um, but also just use the um, resources of who knows Wikipedia or whatever to find out what what it is that the book is, and then you can talk about to what degree it, it reflects what you know the the style. That I mean, I think thank you for saying that because I think one of the things I've been sort of trying to insist upon is that if we are going to sort of promote more reviews of literature and translation, we also need to promote a culture of language learning. Um, uh, you know, insisting that even if critics don't know the source language that, you know, encouraging critics to be multilingual, to think about language, to not just sort of read things, you know, like, I, I do think there's there's something to sort of, you know, re reviewing literature and translation as literature and translation, not just sort of reviewing it the same way you would review um, any book that comes to you in English, so... I could not agree more. Translation is not um, um, some something that obviates the need to know other languages. I would hate it if anybody thought that. This is w one person's idea of what, but but it, it, translation is part of knowing other languages. All language speaking other languages um, is about translating in your own head, et cetera. Probably even speaking your own language. It's not a different thing. It's the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have another question um, from the audience. This is from Chad. I'm curious what you all make of the recurring image of the Garonne. The book opens with the waters rising and closes with the idea that it might be a woman in green. Yeah. That kind of came and I kind of like, I don't know. There's so much. Well, you all in this discussion have so often used the idea, the image of, of overflowing, which is just brilliant, which never occurred to me. And so in that way, yeah. right? I guess it has an identity and then it overflows its identity, right? So. Yeah, I, I think for me, it was a marker for us to return to. And it just made things, it felt like um, something is going to, it felt like, you know, preparing for something to happen. Um, is it the culmination of something? Is it the beginning of something? It's just like what, you know, and this anticipation and this knowing and this reoccurrence, you know, this this inevitability. And that's what it was sort of like tone for me and mood and, and it gave me like a lot of anxiety. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I agree. I, I love that the idea of it as a marker and it is something that opens and closes the book. And um, it made me think a little bit of... Um, when I was at a residency in Nebraska, where I think um, State Jordan is in, uh, walking up to the um, edge of the Mississippi River, I think, and and hearing like, this is where the river is some of the time, but sometimes the river is a mile past this point and um, it, it floods the gas station and so on. And, you know, you could say a river is destructive, life-giving, you know, dark, light, fast, slow, and probably is all of these things in different places. It's a great and really rich metaphor. Do we have another question or? No, I, I think like, um, I think that we are <laughs> that the question's almost at the end of the night. Another thing that you know, about the rivers, this does of course play into the, to the uh, auto fictional aspect of it. I mean, this, she, she lived at the time um, in a little town in Southwestern France on that river, et cetera. That's a, that area of France around Bordeaux. Um, is uh, is one, if in the early books, like um, my heart hemmed in for a while. She lived. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, um, that time of year, she lived in Normandy for a while, and that book is clearly associated with the landscape of Normandy. Many, so many of the later books are all of the later books really are centered around the 
around Bordeaux and the outskirts of Bordeaux. And so that's that's a that's a another kind of marker. It's uh, it's the it's um, an intimate part of the personality, the nature, the, the the landscape, but the being of that entire part of of uh, southwestern France. Well, just I know we're almost at the end, so I shouldn't ask, but um, I remember reading that um, Marie spends a lot of time in Berlin and lives mostly there. Um, is all of her work centered in the south of France, like her fictional work? Um, when no. will we get an urban, a uh, German urban novel or something? Yeah, it was very. I mean, Ladivine, uh, she's largely out of Berlin now. She mostly lives in Paris now. Um, she, um, Ladivine is largely set in Berlin. Um, but I would think ever since... Uh, ever since I think actually this book, ever since uh, um, self portrait in green, the Bordeaux area has always been a major part of her of, uh, of the background. Great. Well, I'm so excited to have had the chance to talk to all of you about this, and excited for all of you out there to pick up a copy at uh, Brookline Booksmith. <laughs> Thank you all so much. This has been incredible. I could not imagine a better team to talk about this book. We have beautiful finished copies here at the store. Um, as always with two lines, it's a stunning object as well as a stunning translation and a stunning piece of literature. And I encourage you to go get it at us, from us or from your local independent. Anyway, I will say good night to you all. I just see a couple last little notes in the chat. Thank you everyone for joining us. It's been incredible. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And good night. Good night.